this sermon will be the most controversial sermon probably that I have ever given. It is pure meat. You're getting no milk. I think it's time we get off the milk route. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with uh, giving sermons on the holy days and the, uh, you know, the um, food laws and so on. But, obviously, we're coming down to an end time. Now, whether I live to see it or not, undoubtedly there are people in this room that will. And we need to know, we need to know what's going on. <clears throat> you might think, well, if it's so controversial, why give it? That's a good question. Good question. I ask it myself. Why am I going to give this? It would get me in a ton of trouble if I was a minister in rural. As a matter of fact, it would get me fired immediately. Immediately. They never touch the subject. The Catholics would run from it with their skirts as high as they could get them so they could run real fast. The Protestants followed, and Churches of God followed that. They wouldn't even talk about it. I don't know, you may have heard a sermon on this subject, <clears throat> but I never did. I never did. Turn with me for one second to Amos, the third chapter. Amos, the third chapter. And let's read what God said about what he is doing and going to do and so on. Amos 3, and let's read verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing. Now, if I stop right there, <laughs> you see, that's taking out of context, isn't it? I can prove to you God does nothing. Well, we know better than that. Unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Now, he's telling us here, he is not going to bring this end time upon us unless he has told us. Now, whether you want to believe it or not is up to you. Is up to you. But Christ made, a, he made two statements. That's why I'm giving this sermon. He gave two statements. He said, watch. And then he said, what to watch? Did you realize that? We look right over it. He told us what to watch. All right, first of all, let's see what he said about watching. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And let's read verse 42. Just a single verse in this case. He said, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. All right, watch means to be aware. Uh, the military will use the term, and they have guards watching the fort, you see. They're watching for an enemy and so on. So watch. But I'm wondering what I need to watch. Well, we're going to find out. Luke 21. Let's read the, the other two as well. Luke 21 and 36. 21, 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Interesting as says the Son of Man, take particular note of that. And while I'm on that subject, Christ never called himself the Son of God. Do you realize that? He always said he was the Son of Man. Now I know Pharaoh said, are you the Son of God? He said, you, have, you said it. He didn't say it, you see. He always called himself the Son of Man. Uh, now that's got a little importance to us a little later on. One more, Revelation, to watch. <laughs> May sound like a strange place, but here it is. Revelation, the third chapter, and verse 3. Revelation 3.3. 3. <clears throat> Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will watch, therefore, if you will watch, I will come upon you, I'm sorry, if you, I didn't think that sounded right, if you do not watch, therefore, if you do not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I come upon you. Now, obviously then, you take the reverse of that, if you watch, you're going to know, or you're going to have a pretty good idea. A pretty good idea 
Watch, he says. If you don't, you're in trouble. All right, now, what do we watch? I love sermons that they get up and say, you've got to repent. They never tell you what to repent of. I've heard some of them. Walk out kind of, that was a good sermon, except what do I do? What do I do? Watch. All right, we were told to watch world events. Well, I have no problem with that. You better. You better. Watch the sky. What's up in the sky nowadays? Remember, what, two or three years ago when the shuttle came down and exploded and burnt? It was on a Sabbath. I was going, actually, I was going to watch for my home. I forgot it, or I would have seen it. But it was Sabbath morning. I'm getting ready for church, and I, I forgot about it. <coughs> That's a sight in the sky. Supposing the American Indians would have seen that. What would they have thought? I mean, you know, back uh, before they knew white man was here, as we put it. <coughs> we were told to watch Europe, and especially Germany. Well, I'm not saying not to. But, you know, God, Christ could have said, watch Assyria. That's supposed to be Germany. But he didn't, did he? But he did give us something to watch. Matthew 24. Here it is. Matthew 24. Then we're going to discuss what it is that he said to watch. Matthew 24. And um, verse 39, <coughs> excuse me, through, I'm sorry, 34 through 39. 34 through 39, Matthew 24. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Now, all things, you know, this end time he's talking about, isn't it? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will by no means pass away. So what Christ is saying, you see, is real, true, and going to happen. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, notice. But as, it, as the days of Noah were, ooh, he's giving us something here. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, did you just realize what he said? The end time when Christ returns, when he comes back, is going to be like it was in the days of Noah. Now, do you suppose he gave us any idea what it was going to be like in the days of Noah? Yeah. Did mankind themselves? Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of uh, information out there written by the people that lived through that time. We've got a couple of books here I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit with you. Then to is the, uh, yeah, okay, verse 38, I knew it wasn't quite through. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking. Oh, uh, what's wrong with eating and drinking? Nothing. It's normal, isn't it? It's normal. That's what people do. It's a lot of fun. There's nothing wrong with that. Oh, I mean, we can, some people take it to excess. We understand that. Uh, but that's normal. Marrying and giving in marriage. Oh, what's wrong with that? <coughs> well, there's a lot wrong with it if the wrong people are getting married. And we'll talk about that a little later also. Until the day that Noah entered the ark. All right, Christ just told us what to watch, didn't he? Watch and see the world becoming like it was before the flood. Like it was before the flood. Well, as a matter of fact, 1 Timothy 5, 14, you don't need to turn there, but that's a command for the young women to marry. God has nothing against marriage at all. Now, Paul did say for those that can stay single, it'd be better for them at the end time because they don't have someone to be responsible for is what he was talking about. <clears throat> Isaiah 42. One more here on prophecy. Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42 and uh, verse 9. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Oh, what former things? Have you ever heard the term history repeats itself? Aren't those former things? Yeah, it is. 
Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. He says he's going to let you know. Now, of course, what you do with it after that is your business. Isn't it? Always is. As I say, I'm going to give you meat today. You may not be able to digest it. You may not be able to digest it. But I do feel for a very definite reason that this was a time to give it. This is something I've known for quite some time, another one of those things I sat on for a while until I got a little encouragement. And that happened to come from a very, very fine friend of mine by the name of Darwin. We were talking about this. He was frank. You've got to give that as a sermon. Well, it was a little bit like I was talking to Randy, my second son, years ago. I said something about a sermon that was kind of interested in giving. And I said, well, won't you give it? Oh, I said, I'm just kind of afraid. He said, wait a minute. He said, what are you afraid of, man or God? Said, you don't need to say another word. You don't need to say another word. This one was maybe up on kind of that category. I have one more sermon. And then my repertoire is complete. I don't know. I have always felt that when I have finished what God wants me to do, I won't last 10 seconds. I've always felt that way. And maybe, maybe I can feel it coming. I don't know. I'm not a prophet. I'm not trying to <laughs> stand here and sacrifice myself or something. But I've just always felt that way because, you see, he's kept me alive. Maybe if I stay around long enough, I'll give you a sermon on that. I should have died in 1965. The only reason I didn't was because he kept me alive. That was just one time. There's about eight or nine altogether. Anyhow. So I know for a fact he has kept me alive for a reason. And the only reason I can see is so that I would give you this information. 99% of our ministers out there wouldn't touch it. They wouldn't touch most of what I've given you because of somebody over them that wouldn't like it. And they lose a paycheck or uh, get fired or whatever. <clears throat> see, those things don't worry me. I'm not worried what a man says. I'm not even worried what you say. You can come up to me when a sermon and say, Frank, you are full of, you know what? <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. If you want to tell me I'm wrong, give me chapter and verse. Don't start saying, I think you're wrong, and here's what I think. I don't care what you think. You don't care what I think. Anyhow, uh, let's go on from there. All right, the former things have happened. Now, let's take a look. Where are we going to find out about the flood? Anybody know what chapter? Now, I spent so much time here, you know, to me it's kind of automatic. Genesis, obviously, chapter 6. Let's read what God had written. Now, I didn't make this up. I didn't sneak into your Bible last night and stick something in there to verify what I'm going to say. God put it in here for a reason. And I want to know what the reason was. And that's what we're going to find out today. Chapter 6, verse 1. <clears throat> now it came to pass, when man, now this would be mankind, obviously, began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. Interesting, he mentions daughters. He didn't bother to mention sons, did he? Anyhow. Then the sons of God. Hmm. Interesting statement, isn't it? We're going to get to this a little later on. Who are the sons of God? Who are the sons of God? Then the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Um, hmm, didn't we read a little earlier about uh, when Christ said that they, you know, they, they married and they chose wives and so on, whomever they wanted? Uh-huh. Here we have the same phrase. And he said, at the time of the flood, you see. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive or abide with man forever. And again, that would be mankind. For he is indeed flesh. 
yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, just as a sidelight here, that's where we get 120 years for Noah to build the ark. You've heard the figure, I'm sure. You can't find it anywhere else. Uh, but apparently, here he's saying, oh, you've got 120 years, and it's, it's over. The flood's coming. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Now, isn't that interesting? As I say, I didn't write this. I'm reading to you what God told Abraham to write. These, these, these giants were born. Now, the word giant, really, as you're going to see in a moment here, is not an accurate at all translation. A better translation is fallen ones. Fallen ones. But notice, they, they are born to these daughters of women after these sons of God come into them. Verse 8. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Well, <laughs> it's been pretty great from day one, hasn't it? Would you have wanted to live in the Middle Ages, Dark Ages? Oh my, I go back and I see what, what they did and so on. I wouldn't have lasted a week with my attitude. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I made them. Now notice he's not just destroying man, he's taking everything, the cattle, the horses, the dogs, the cats, everything except the fish, or oh, the birds as well, everything except the fish. And obviously they're in the water, they're going to survive. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Who are these sons of God? Well, I'll give you a couple of exam or a couple of statements that were made to me with no scriptures. Oh, I'll take that back. One scripture. One. You may be thinking about it. One scripture, but we're going to talk about that as well. I was told by a very notable minister that these cannot be angels, demons. Cannot be. That's interesting, though. A man and woman come together and they, they have these fallen ones, or giants as they're called. I, I, <laughs> doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? But where do they get that from? One scripture. We'll read it. Uh, turn to Matthew, well, it's actually three times, but the same thing. Matthew 22, and then we're going to discuss it. Matthew 22. Because, you see, we have two basic rules, well, more than that, but two basic rules in Bible study, don't we? What are they? Read all the scriptures on your subject, right? What's number two? Let the Bible interpret the Bible, and we're going to do that. All right? Let's read it. Matthew 22 and verse 23 through 30. 23 through 30. That same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, now this is really cute. They're the ones who say there's no resurrection, but yet they're going to ask Christ about the resurrection. <laughs> they came to him and they asked him, Teachers, Moses says that if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up an offspring for his brother. That's true, isn't it? You know, we've gone through this before. Now there, was a, there were seven brothers. The first died after having married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, even all the way to the seventh. Now that girl must have been very infertile, wasn't she? Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, now here's their question, in the resurrection, whose wife is the, is the seven, of the seven, will she be? For they all had her. Good question, isn't it? Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Now, that's the only scripture I've been given. Does that say the angels can't marry? No, it really doesn't. It just says you'll be like the angels. But 
I'll, I'll accept that, that the angels don't marry. I don't, I, don't, I don't believe they do. Now, on that basis then, the angels don't marry, therefore the demons can't marry. Is that right? Well, have you ever heard of Catholic nuns? They don't marry. Why? They're told they cannot marry, aren't they? Um, a Catholic priest, they don't marry. They, they're told they cannot marry. Do they have the ability? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, it says here the angels do not marry. Angels obey God every word, don't they? Do demons? I'm afraid not. Why do you think they became demons? Why do you think Satan fell? He did not obey God. So you cannot use that scripture to apply back here to a demon. I know they're called angels of God. Even demons can be called that. But on the other hand, that may be where they fell when they came down and disobeyed and went down and married those women. All right, let's try the next one. Mark 12. Mark 12. And verse 25. <clears throat> For they, uh, uh, yeah. For the, uh, when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like uh, the angels in heaven. See, it says it's the same thing. Luke 20 is the other verse. Let's read it. We'll read them all. Luke 20 and 34 through 36. Jesus answered and said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. All right, this age is today, isn't it? But those who are uh, counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the, angel, equal to the angels. Isn't that interesting? I rather thought the sons of God in the resurrection would be superior to the angels. Anyhow, and are, let's see, and are sons of God. That's true. But sons, of, uh, being sons of the resurrection. Now, did you notice when they become the sons of God? He tells us in the resurrection. In the resurrection. Now, you could be called a son of God today. Because God knows he is going to resurrect you and make you a son. But you don't become that son until the resurrection. A little uh, interesting thought there. All right. Now where are we? We've got, we've got uh, sons of God that have married women and had children. And we find that the, the, uh, those in the resurrection don't marry. You want to see a flaw in that one? First resurrection, what's going to happen? Oops. Oops. You're going to marry Christ. Is there a marriage there? Absolutely. Now, you're not going to marry each other. I'll grant you that. In a second resurrection, definitely not. <clears throat> definitely not. I was told by another man in, when I was in Worldwide, well, those sons of God back there, those were the converted uh, Christians would say, and we weren't called that then, the faithful followers of God. And they went out and just married all these old women. Then the subject was changed instantly. Don't people think about things before they make statements? Now think about this. We're, we're going to get to it in a second. What caused the flood? The sons of God marrying these women. You mean to tell me Christ-called chosen people caused the flood? That's exactly what this statement says. They caused the flood? If they married these women and God didn't approve of it? Another one I had given to me with no thought. Even worse. And this was last week. Well, now, see, you never get a scripture on these. Well, they, the, the sons of God back there, those are the, uh, the believers that fell away. And the person was happy and walked away. You know, the ones that fell away, which I, I suppose were going to go in the lake of fire, they're called the sons of God, and Abraham never was, Isaac never was, Jacob never was, Joseph never was, uh, Moses never was, David never was, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, you name anybody you want. 
and you don't find any human being in the Old Testament being called the Son of God. Not there. It is not there. All right. What's wrong with marriage? It's a good thing, isn't it? It's a good thing. You know, it creates family. Family is a good thing. The, the countries that are successful are based on families. They're based on families. Uh, well, for instance, just, just take the Mormon church. They're based on family. And there's a very, very successful church. And they do very well. They, they rear their children very well and so on. It's based on family. So what is wrong? Well, <clears throat> I had this thrown at me. Well, these sons of God, now these were, uh, remember, converted people back then. And they were intermarrying with different races. You know, with the white race, the brown race, and the yellow race, and the black race, and so on. I thought, oh, really? Hmm. Where'd you get that from? Well, it, it just makes sense, because they weren't obeying God. Uh, where did God ever say you couldn't marry another race? I don't want chapter and verse. It's not there. Now, I'm not saying God particularly approves of it. I think he probably wanted the races to stay pure. But you can't find a scripture where he says, you shall not, okay, a white man shall not marry a black man or a yellow man or, what am I saying, man, woman. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm going to get the men and men. <clears throat> it isn't there. Matter of fact, matter of fact, if you're thinking, if you're thinking, turn with me to Numbers. Here's an interesting event. Here's another one that a church doesn't like to spend any time on. Numbers, the uh, 12th chapter. Now, who's in Numbers 12? Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Let's read it. Numbers 12, verse 1. Then Miriam and Moses spoke against, I'm sorry, then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. Ooh, why? Because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. Whoa, wait a minute. What color are the Ethiopian people? They're not white. They're not white. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. <laughs> it says it twice. That he supposed God came, was going to come down here and say, Yep, Miriam and Aaron, you're right. He shouldn't have done that. Well, let's see. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it, and now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord came to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, and uh, he said, Come out, you three. <laughs> to the tabernacle of meeting. So they came out. Then the Lord came down to the, in a pillar of, cl of the cloud and he stood in the door of the tabernacle. Isn't that interesting? Do you don't wonder why they always were in the door? Because that's where the judgments were made. They had they actually had, in, in, in the cities, they had little cubicles, like little rooms. And you go in there, you see, and uh, as this one guy would call it, passport control whether or not you got to go in. But the judges sat in the doorway. Well, you find a lot of them. Abraham was sitting in his doorway when Christ showed up. Uh, a lot was sitting in, in the doorway when the two angels showed up and so on. Uh, so it's a judgment place. And he called Aaron, Moses, uh, and, or Miriam, and they went. And then he said to them, Hear now my word. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in dreams. Now, I have not had any visions or dreams, all right? <laughs> I, do come to, I do get some answers while I'm asleep sometimes. I'll wake up and, oh, man, you know, now that's the answer I've been looking for. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face. Oh, at this point, I think Miriam and Aaron are shaking in their boots. Even plainly, and not in dark sayings. And he uh, sees uh, the form of the Lord. That's right. He saw the outline, the back of Christ up on a mountain, you know, when, when he came down to give the Ten Commandments. Why then have you not been afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Oh, my. 
Oh my. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against him, and he departed. Now I ask you, where did Christ say, you were right, Miriam, you were right, Aaron. He should not have married that Ethiopian. Didn't do that, did he? Now, as I say, that's not necessarily saying he approved of it because there's a lot of, you know, sexual activity went on like uh, David and so on, which God didn't approve of. He had more than one wife and so on. But he certainly didn't condemn the marriage, did he? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. There's another one. And when I discovered this one, I'll tell you, I was shocked. And I'll bet you will be too. I'll bet you will be too. Turn to Genesis 38. I have had a map in the back of my Bible for I don't know how many years. I have glanced at it. I never really paid that much attention to it. I've got it right here in my hand. But let me read this first. Uh, Genesis 38. It came to pass at the time that Judah departed from his brethren, and he visited a certain uh, Adamite whose name was Ahara, and Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he married her and he went into her and he produced three sons by her, didn't they? Now notice, she was a Canaanite. A Canaanite. Now, have you always assumed, I always did, that the Canaanites were white? Have you? You know, I could go back and say, what color was Adam and Eve? I mean, a white person is so arrogant. He thinks everybody in the Bible was white. I don't know. Well, I'll tell you what color Adam and Eve were. The color of Christ, because they looked like him, right? And Christ, well, anyhow. But the Canaanites, what color are they? Have you got a map like this in the back of your Bible? It shows where the descendants of uh, Abraham went. Uh, you know, uh, Jeth uh, or, uh, Jephthah, Ham, and Shem. And I really, uh, as I say, I had looked at this before, never thought that much about it, until I read this. Until I read this. All right, for those of you on the, uh, seeing this, I'll hold it up. Now I'm going to hold it back. Do you see the green marks on here? Um, no, those are descendants of Ham. Now it's a known fact that the black race and the brown race and so on came from Ham. Do you know who they are? Listen. Well, Egypt, of course. We understand that. The Philistines. The Philistines. You mean to tell me Goliath was black? Apparently so. I mean, I didn't make the map up. I'm, I'm just taking what they're giving me. The Canaanites came from Ham. And I read here where Judah married a Canaanite. Now, if she's black, God certainly didn't condemn him. Now, I'll grant it, uh, Christ didn't come through the three sons because of you know, what all happened and so on. Uh, also, the Amorites and the Hittites came from Ham. And I, I know I read that and I thought, why didn't I ever see this before? They're right up around the, uh, uh, the, uh, oh, the Great Sea, uh, Mediterranean Sea, right around there, you see. Of course, then they migrated later down into Africa. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. And here Judah married, apparently, I have to say apparently because she was a Canaanite, it says here they were, they were black, unless you can prove to me otherwise that the map is wrong. And God didn't condemn it. I wonder... I've, I've often thought about this. Who did the 12 boys marry? Now, they didn't marry back into the family. God at that point had already established the fact that he had a bloodline, a very particular bloodline that he was going to stay with. Who did those boys marry? Well, I guess whoever was around. We know Joseph married an Egyptian. Now, what color is she? Black? Yeah. Yeah. Who did the other boys marry? Uh, maybe that's why the, the Jews are darker today. Or maybe they were always dark. I don't know. I don't know. I, I wouldn't even try to figure that one out. It doesn't matter. My, my, my point is, God didn't bring the flood on because they were interracially marrying. That's a ridiculous idea. A ridiculous idea. Oh...
Okay, who caused the flood? I say who because it was man. If it wasn't the animals, it was man. And who's going to cause the great destruction that's coming upon this nation, upon this world, when Christ returns? Man. Do you remember the statement Christ made after uh, Noah came off the ark? He said, whatever a man decides to do, it will be granted him. Whoa. Remember 1962, I believe it was, when John F. K. got up and said, we will put a man on the moon and bring him back before the end of the decade? I guess I can <laughs> I probably kind of laughed at that, you know, being a pilot, and yeah, sure. We did it, didn't we? We did it. What all has happened in the last century? I'll, I'll just take my dad. He was born in 1900. He was born when they had horses and buggies. They didn't have automobiles. Horses and buggies. And my granddad rode around the horse and buggy. My dad did when he was younger. When he became a teenager, I guess uh, he, he was telling me he bought an old uh, second-hand Model T. He went through the automobile stage. From there, he went aviation, airplanes. Second, I mean, the First World War, he was not in it. He was just a little bit too young for it when it was over. And from there, he went on up to you know, supersonic airplanes, faster than the speed of sound. That's faster than a bullet. Oh, you all know that one, don't you? You know, Superman? <laughs> From there, he went to the atomic age, the atomic bombs. My dad, his lifetime. Nobody in any lifetime that we know of could begin to compare with that, could they? Then he went from there to a man walking on the moon. He was still alive. Fantastic, isn't it? And we think things aren't rapidly moving. Now look at us. Look at us now. You can get a hit. Now, don't tell me I need a hearing aid. I keep hearing that. I do not. <laughs> you can get a hearing aid. Now, if, you, if, if, you, if, you, if you're old enough, you can remember when they used to have a hearing aid with a box down here and the cord coming up here because here was all the mechanics of the thing in there. Now they have a little, I'm sure you know that, little bitty thing that slips inside the ear. You can't even see it. You can't even see it. I mean, and it's got a battery in it. <laughs> Fantastic, isn't it? Your cell phone. Oh I, oh, I didn't turn mine off. I hope it doesn't ring. Your cell phone. My cell phone has more computer power than the, uh, the uh, uh, shuttle, or one, not one the shuttle, anyhow, that went to the moon and brought the, the, yeah, the Apollo and brought them back. My cell phone can do way more than what that the computer could. Isn't that amazing? And what have they got now that we don't even know about? Everything getting smaller and smaller, isn't it? Amazing, isn't it? Man has been able to do what he wants to. And what he wants to is not necessarily good. Not necessarily good. I get to the end, I'll, I'll give you a few things there. All right, now I said, that, let, let's, let's go back here to Genesis uh, 6. I said, we're going to let the Bible interpret the Bible, all right? Are you willing to accept that? Let the Bible tell us who it is. Verse 2, chapter 6, verse 2. Then the sons of God. All right. It's mentioned twice here. Here and in verse 4. That's two. How many more times is it mentioned in the Old Testament? Three more times. The sons of God is mentioned five times in the Old Testament. Six times in the New Testament. Now granted in the New Testament we are called the sons of God. But we're not talking New Testament, are we? We're talking Old Testament. We're talking before the flood. Really, really, really Old Testament. All right, turn with me to the book of... Anybody? Nobody? <laughs> Job. The book of Job. It's a fantastic book. It has a lot in it. The book of Job. Are you there? Let's read verse 6. Now when uh, there was a, uh, I'm sorry, now there was a day when the sons of God, chapter 1, verse of uh, chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came with them. Sons of God. I was told by one person, those are people. 
I said, really? You tell me how a man or a woman is going to go to heaven and present themselves before Father. <laughs> I mean, people make statements just sometimes that just blow my mind. Oh, I've got better proof than this. Chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to give you all three times here. All five, actually. We read the first three now. Again. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them to present himself also. All right, there's two times. Sons of God. Now, obviously, obviously they're angels, aren't they? Well, do you want positive proof? Chapter 38. Chapter, same book, Job, 38. 38. And uh, verse 7, 38, verse 7. Now look at this. I'm going to pick it up in verse 4 to, to read up to it so we're in context. Now God is talking to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Oh yeah, Job, where were you? <laughs> you weren't even a thought, were you? Tell me if you understand who determined its measurements. Who decided how big to make the earth, you see? Surely you know. <laughs> or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Job, what's the earth hanging on out here? And we understand uh, gravity, don't we? What's it hanging on? Now look at this. Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together. When the morning stars sang together. And... All of the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, you want to tell me there was a man alive when God created the earth? Don't think so. So, who are they? Angels. Now, do you realize anything that God created, he made himself, can be legally called a son. Adam was the son of God. Uh, Cain and Abel were not. They were the son of Adam. The angels were created by God, therefore they can be called the sons of God. Uh, if you watched, uh, ever watched Star Trek, uh, when Data made the, his, his mechanical girl, uh, his, his own equivalent, and he called that his, his daughter, it was a girl, he called that his daughter, you see, because he created her. And it was a, it was a, a true phrase. So now who are the sons of God? according to scripture. Now, if you say no, give me chapter and verse. That's all I ask for. I know you're not going to find it, though, but you can look. Who are the sons of God? Why does it blow our minds to think that an angel turned into a demon could come down here and manifest himself as a man, as a man, and impregnate a woman? Oh, I, I've had uh, people laugh at me on that. Well, good grief, I can impregnate a woman. I did six times. <laughs> and I'm just a man. Oh, yeah, but you're flesh. Well, don't you think they took on a fleshly body? I had another person ask me, well, would a woman really want to marry a, a, a demon? Well, if it looked like a real handsome man, besides that, you know, how many women out here would love to have sex with some of these great stars and so on? I mean, they, all of them do, they can. And I'm not putting you ladies down, don't get me wrong. But they do, don't they? They go out there and swoon over the singers and so on. Plus the fact, plus the fact, they get a son that is a demigod. Half man, half God. You find that all through your old myths, we call them. Do you suppose they're based on anything that's real? Do you suppose they're based on anything that's real? Let me give you one. Let me give you one. You ever hear of Alexander the Great? Oh, who hasn't? He wanted immortality. It was always questioned. You can read about his life and so on. It was always questioned as to whether Philip was really his dad or not whether he was really his dad or not. But he went to the oracle there, I don't know if the oracle of Delphi, whoever it was, and talked to her, and she told him that he had been conceived, or his mother had been conceived by one of the gods, and he was a demigod. But he wanted immortality, and she told him, you go to Egypt to find out, because the oracle there will give you the answers. All right, 
he formed an army, remember? He took off and he went after the Persians and he defeated them handily. They take off on a dead run for home. He didn't chase them and destroy them. He did that later. He turned south of all things and went to Egypt. And they do know that he went and saw the, uh, the uh, oracle. There's no record of what was said because he was there alone with her. But he wanted immortality. Well, of course, his old physical body died, didn't it, when he was 33 years old. But, kind of ironic, isn't it? In a sense, he did obtain immortality. We know him by name. <laughs> you know, when we think of it that way. But you see, he thought he was half God and half man. I don't believe he was. If he was, that's all right. I don't care. But he thought he was. That's just one example. Uh, there, there are many uh, that we could, uh, could do. All right, uh, now, can an angel take on the form of a human being? Well, and this, yeah, we know what they can, but I want, it on, uh, I want it on tape. Genesis 18. Genesis 18. I want to give you scriptures on these things. And um, verse 1. <clears throat> then the uh, Lord appeared to him, that's going to be Abraham, by the terabyteth tree of Mamre, and he was sitting, notice, in the tent door. He's the boss. He's directing everything that's going on in his little city, his little town, in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and he looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. When he saw them, he ran up uh, from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed down to the ground, and, and he said to them, uh, uh, let's see, if, if you found favor in my sight, uh, don't pass by, and so on. He said, here's a little water to wash your feet and, and so on. Now we know, I'm not going to read the rest of it, we know that it was Jesus Christ and two angels. And they told him, we're on our way to Sodom and Gomorrah because we've heard that it is very wicked. Now this is part of the wickedness we're going to see that goes right back to, uh, to, to uh, the flood. And it's happening today wholesale. We'll get to it. All right. Now he fed them. Oh, I had one person say, oh, well, they didn't really have a body. That was just a hologram. Oh. <laughs> you know, why do we guess at things? Why are we afraid to accept what the Bible says? I'm not, and I'll tell you what it says. If I get a bullet between my eyes for doing it, so be it. So be it. Anyhow, yeah, he fed them. They ate a meal and so on. And, uh, well, I won't get into that. I'll do that at Passover time. Because this, I believe, was Passover time. Interesting. Yeah, there's a few little hints there. All right. Now, how about the, the Abraham and Christ? They were talking. And the great, great, great uh, sales pitch came. You remember? <laughs> the negotiation. If there's 50, we did not destroy the city. Oh, yeah. If there's 45 and so on, down to 10. But what did the other two angels do? They, they hooked it out of there. They went to Sodom and Gomorrah, well, Sodom in, in particular. Chapter 19, first five verses. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the uh, gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself. Now notice he was sitting in the gate there again. See, he's one of the officials of the city. He bowed himself to them, and to his face to the ground. Now, both Abraham and Lot recognized them as angels. And Christ is the case, in the case with Abraham. And he said to them, Here now, my Lord, please turn in your servant's house and spend the night, because he knew what would happen to him, and wash your feet. That's interesting, isn't it? Then you may uh, rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, we'll spend the night out here in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so they turned in to him, and they entered his house. Then he made them a feast. A feast, you notice. And notice one of the things they had. It's interesting. And he baked unleavened bread. Interesting, isn't it? Well, we know the story, don't we? I don't need to read any more. These men were sodomites. That's where our term uh, uh, sodomy comes from. From, from right, right here, you see. This term. These men were sodomites. And apparently the whole city was going that way. It even says over in Hebrews that, that poor Lot was, he was uh, uh, you know, broken at heart over what was going on in the city. Well, it was his town, you know. He lived there. I could understand that. But my point is they were men. 
They had a body just like you and I. Can they manifest that body? Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, let's not try to, to downgrade an angel as to what they can do. Please, whatever you do, don't do that. Oh, let's see. Okay, then, then how, how about, well, can a demon form a, a, you know, a body like a man? Well, an angel can. Did God take that ability away from the demons? Don't think so. If he did, why did he lock them up? We're going to get to that in a few minutes. Why did he lock them up in Tartarus? They're in chains. They're in chains. And these are the ones that were back there at the flood. It tells us that at the flood. They're locked up. So they can't continue what they were doing. By the way, that was a very clever move on Satan's part. Very clever. Think about this. Christ or, had told uh, Eve that the Messiah would come through her you know, blood, her bloodline. Now, if you get demonic, uh, okay, we'll use a term, they didn't know what it was, uh, genetic code in there, ooh, is Christ going to be born in a bloodline that has a demon in it? Don't think so. Don't think so. I've got a little proof on that too, we'll, we'll get to a little later on. But you see, here's the reason for the flood. Do you ever wonder why God, because people were wicked? He had to destroy these people before they, and they got the entire world uh, with, the, with the Satan bloodline. If the entire world is part of it, now how's Christ going to be born? He can't. So Satan has won the battle, hasn't he? Well, God took care of that, just wiped them all out. He took the animals as well because of what they were doing, and I'll get to that at the end with the animals, obviously. All right. Are you still with me? <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, the demons. Second Corinthians. Here, it tells us right here very plainly. Second Corinthians 11. And verse 14 and 15. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Now, what do you mean transforms? Uh, don't we have a toy called a transformer? You can make it an airplane or make it a soldier and whatever all that they do with the thing. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, those would be the demons, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness uh, whose end will be according to their works. Now, can they? I have seen a demon. That shock you? I've seen a demon. Matter of fact, I was almost choked to death by a demon. He was in the process of it, and I called out to Christ to rebuke him. He left. I was thrown out of bed. I haven't fallen out of bed in my life. I was thrown across the room by a demon. Believe me, don't mess around. Don't invite one in, whatever you do. And I also saw one coming through, not open the door, coming through the door. I mean, here was the form of hands and your know, face coming right through the door. Oh, I'll never forget that. That's, that's a horrifying experience. So, yeah, they, they can form themselves. I know for a fact I've been there. I can tell you that where I was. I can tell you the date, the week, the year. Never forget it. Never forget it. All right. Now, <clears throat> I have known for 30 years that there were a lot of uh, clay tablets over from the Middle East, from uh, Ur, uh, Chaldea, in that area. About 100,000 of them. And now I'm finding out there's another 100,000. And I kept wondering, why doesn't some, they're old, three, 4,000 years old. I kept wondering, why doesn't somebody translate these things? So we have an eyewitness of what was going on. I never heard of anybody doing that. Until a few years ago, I walked into Barnes, good old Barnes and Noble. <laughs> I walked in, and right as you walk straight in, there's a table in this one, and they have all the new books on that table. Well, the book that was number one up on top, right in front, was this one. Can you see that there, right there? Was this one. And it says, The End of Days. Obviously, that caught my attention. Oh, I pick it up, and oh, what is this? Uh, Armageddon and the prophecies of the return, ooh. And so I look on the back, and I, I see uh, the author's written some other book, and then I open it up, you know, the fly in here, and I start reading it. 
and it says he had been translating these things for 30 years. What? I nearly fell over. For, needless to say, that's the book. I bought it. Then I found out he has written 13 altogether. I've got all 13 of them. And you don't need to buy all of those. And I haven't read them all yet. And the one that I particularly like, uh, I'll read a little bit out of this to you, is uh, There Were Giants Upon the Earth. And his name is Zachariah Sitch Sitchkin. And he's a good Jewish fellow. He's a good Jewish fellow. All right, and well, let me read it right now while I'm right here. Here's how he got started translating, the, and he's, he's made a lifetime of it. The reader, if familiar with the King James Bible, our English Bible, of the, uh, will recognize these verses. Now, he read some verses up here in chapter 6 of Genesis as the, per, uh, the uh, preamble to the story of the Genesis flood. Uh, now, we've already read uh, you know, the Genesis 6. The great flood in which Noah huddled in an ark. I like that. He huddled. I don't think quite that. But anyhow, was saved to repopulate the earth. The reader, if familiar with my writings, will also recognize these verses as the reason why my, uh, why many decades ago, a schoolboy, that was him, was prompted to ask his teacher, why is it giants who is the subject of these verses when the word in the original Hebrew is Nephilim, which stems from the Hebrew word uh, Nephilo, which means fallen down, to be downed, to come down, and in no way, giant. The schoolboy was I. Instead of being uh, congratulated on my linguistic ability, I was harshly reprimanded. Sitchkin, sit down. The teacher hissed with a, 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 a repressive anger. You don't question the Bible. I was deeply hurt that day, for I was not questioning the Bible. On the contrary, I was pointing out the need to understand its accuracy, and that was what changed my life's direction to pursue the Nephilim. Who were they, and where were they, and, and uh, heard they, where they migrate to and descend, and so on. That's how he got started, searching. He's traveled the world over, and it's interesting reading. Uh, now, these clay tablets have a variety of things on them, uh, like a will, uh, a grant, a land grant, uh, an order from the king, then some religious books, then one that shows the gods. That now, now is a demon going to take credit for something? Well, of course he is. What's a demon want? Same thing, Satan, to be the boss. They they claim that they they, they inhabited. The, I'm sorry, they created man to be a slave. Well, I could believe the slave part. They claim to be the gods, you see. And it goes on and on. Now, one of my sons says, oh, Dad, how do you know he's telling the truth there? Oh, brother. <laughs> well, there are 12 men that are doing this. And they, they compare back and forth their notes and so on. And, you know, I mean, he's doing it by himself. Oh, yeah. Uh, another person says, oh, it's all science fiction. I said, sure. Uh, 100,000 clay tablets of Star Trek. Wonderful. <laughs> you see, we've got something that was written by the people that were there and saw it. And they knew what was going on. Now that has been um, manipulated down, you see. The Catholic Church says, no way. They, the, the lost books of the Bible, do you know why they're lost? Because they have the angels marrying women. Oh, much, much, much more detail. Much more detail, you see. And the Catholic, no way. Get that out of here. And so they became the lost books, you see. They weren't, weren't included. And I would assume God didn't want them included, or they would have been. But, there, but it is there, you see. Uh, okay, so we, we have then a good account of eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses. What they wrote. We have an account of what God said to write. And they match up, don't they? Yes, they do. All right. Now... To bring this to a conclusion, turn to Jude. Let's read a little bit more here of what God had to say about the demonic world. Jude, the fifth chapter. By the way, if you start reading uh, different things, I've read a lot uh, on, on this subject. And there are some people that believe that the, uh, the, uh, the sons of the fallen angels, by the, the, the uh, woman, those were the demons. 
Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't buy that at all. But anyhow, it doesn't matter. Jude 5 through 8. But I want you, uh, I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. He's talking about the nation of Israel, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Uh, you know, don't, don't get your hopes up and think, well, he wouldn't dare destroy me because I'm so needed or something. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain. Ooh, how about that? They did not keep their proper domain or their own domain, their own place, but uh, left their own abode, has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness. Give us that same peace of mind if we keep our eyes on him. Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. And uh, verses 5 through 8. This is the one where he says, I will never leave you. Let your conduct be without uh, covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For if uh, he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, do we believe that statement? You see, that's why I can tell anybody that says Christ has left me. No, he hasn't. You only think he has because you took your eyes off of him. And when your eyes are off of him and you don't believe him, Pretty hard for him to bless you, isn't it? Pretty hard for him to bless you. Pretty hard for him to even do anything for you if you want nothing to do with him. Yes, it is. Because you're refusing. I can't give you something if you refuse to accept it, can I? I can offer. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Now, God is your helper. He's, he told the, uh, the disciples before Pentecost, almost 2,000 years ago, wait here in Jerusalem, and when Pentecost comes, I am going to send the helper for you. The helper, of course, being the Holy Spirit. He immersed them in it and so on. How, what can man do to me? Think about it. Now, a man can kill you. That's it. Oh, he can torture you and so on. But well, what can it do to you, really, when you come down to it? That's about it. That's about it. He can take everything you have, but he can, can he take away your faith? Can he take away your salvation? Can he take away your reward if you let him? If you lose your faith, you say, oh, I don't believe in God anymore. God's not with me. And I'll hear people make these kind of statements because God allowed uh, Cedar Rapids to go under 12 foot of water over the flood crest. What's that got to do with God? God's not the one who built the city there. <laughs> What's that got to do with God? Uh, let's read on just a couple more verses here. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith uh, follow. Uh, consider the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You have got to believe that and you've got to remember that he does not change. What he said he wanted us to do yesterday is what he wants us to do today. He told the Israelites what he wanted them to do. And he has told what he wants done in the millennium. And people won't believe it. Their favorite saying is God the same yesterday and tomorrow but different today. That's kind of their favorite. Not so, though. Not so. I got a whole page left. <laughs> All right. We increase our faith in others. We think. You see, when something happens, and we think, number one, why didn't I do that before? Why didn't I trust God before? I have people come to me, and uh, anointing for the sick is just about a thing of the past. Oh, Frank, I'm going to go have my operation next week. Would you, uh, would you anoint me and ask God to, to guide the, uh, the surgeon's uh, scalpel? No. 
You mean you've got a surgeon that's never operated before? Well, if he has to guide the scalpel. I don't mind doing that, and I will do it. I don't like it. That's not what God's all about. No one ever went to Christ and says, I'm going to have an operation. Now, they did operations back then. Don't you kid yourself. You dig into the history a little bit. And if you want an operation, that's fine. I'm not condemning that. But, oh, we happen to remember we need to be anointed. I will anoint you before you go get your tests and ask God to remove whatever it is from you. So when you come back from the test, it's clean bill of health. Healthy. Feel great. Lump is gone. Don't say it hasn't happened. It has. I've been there and I've seen it. I know. Don't have any idea when a lump went away. Pat had a lump about the size of a small egg in her breast. In the early 60s, we had her anointed and forgot about it then. And one day, I don't know who, which one of us discovered it, but it was gone. <laughs> have no idea if it went away slowly or overnight. Have no idea. Pat and I were looking at some pictures of the kids when Becky was probably about a year old. And these were formal pictures that had been taken, you know, at the studio and so on. And here was a great big old black piece of dirt on her cheek. I looked at that and I said, there. Now this was a good friend of ours that, that had this studio. I said, he took a picture of her with dirt on her cheek. And Pat, there, don't you remember? She was born with a birthmark. A birthmark, about the size of a quarter. Red as it could be. We had her anointed and forgot about it. One day we happened to notice it was gone. I have no idea if it went away slowly or if it went away overnight. But it was gone and still gone. If, if she had that today, she'd have a pretty good sized mark because it covered quite a bit of her face. So don't tell me God doesn't today. I know better. I could give you many, many, many more examples. But if you want me to just, you know, have a surgeon. So as I say, an operation I'm not against. I'm not against. I just don't like asking God to guide the surgeon's hand. That just doesn't fit Jesus Christ suffering and so on. But if that's what you want for your prayer, I'll give it. No, I won't refuse. I could, I guess, but I won't. Why did we do that before? Why did we wait so long? Why did I wait so long, number two? You ever done that? Oh, I should have asked God about this a long time ago. Pat was the best one in the world for that one. I'd be storming around the house, couldn't find something. My fault, I laid it down. Not God's fault, he didn't hide it. <laughs> and uh, finally, you know, in, in exasperation, she said, Dear, won't you just pray about it? Well, I used to say, I, this is not God's problem. It's my fault, I did it, I'll find it. So she'd pray about it. Oh, I'll guarantee you within a minute, I'd find it. Every time. I'm not kidding. If I could just mm, give you the number of times that happened. Finally, I began to wise up, you know. Well, maybe the girl's got something here. <laughs> maybe, it does, maybe God does care where I laid it down and does want me to find it. Oh, I don't have it up here with my cell phone. That's the biggest one today. I've lost it before and had to have a neighbor call me. <laughs> kind of embarrassing. Would you mind calling me on my phone? I can't find it. God does do these things. Number three, Christ really can do anything. <coughs> now, we're not going to ask him to do something that is not appropriate. We understand that. Don't ask him for the power of healing. He will give that to someone someday, but it's not going to be the guy that's asking for it. The guy that's asking for it wants to be able to walk around. I can heal people. Watch this. No, no. It doesn't work that way. God won't give it to someone like that. Plus the fact if he ever gives it to you, you're going to die a horrible death. Do you think the doctors would like that? You walk through the hospital. Uh, Scott White. I don't know which direction is it in, down here. If I had the power of healing, I'd walk in there and just go, rum, 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 as fast as I can go. And every one of them get up and run out of there. I think the doctors would be catching me before I get out of there, wouldn't they? They've just lost a lot of money. And don't kid yourself, that's the bottom line of medicine. Money. Money. So God can bless me, but I have to let him. And I let him by trusting him. Now, he may not do it today. He may not do it today. 
He may not even do it tomorrow because it's his timetable, not mine. Not mine. And if he would choose to not bless me at all on whatever the subject might be, that's okay as well, isn't it? Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? What faith did they have? They said, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we know one thing. We worship a God that can save us from your miserable old fiery furnace. But if by chance he decides not to, that's okay also. We're not bowing down. Throw us in. Now, do you, I mean, I'm paraphrasing it. Now, do you suppose they thought they were going to go in and walk around in the fire and come back out? Not many people think that way, do they? But they did. Did they have faith? If they had enough, what would have happened to them? If you've ever been around a fiery furnace, and I mean one that'll melt steel. Melt steel. It's quite a revelation to see. You can't get very close to it. It's so hot yourself. God says he'll bless us. Uh, in Malachi 3.10, I won't turn there, we know what it says. He said, you bring your tithe to the storehouse and I will open the gates of heaven and you won't even be able to contain it. But you see, it takes a little bit of faith on your part to pay your tithes, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It takes a little bit of faith. This isn't something you just kind of like to do, is it? You know, just, oh yeah, I like to get rid of 10% of my money. Did you do that when you, when you were, you know, before Christ? No. Well, I'll take that back. Some of you may have. depends on the church you're in. Or they came around and demanded it from you or whatever. But he can't bless you, you see. He can't pour it out on you if you say, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay. Let's take another good one. Remember a fellow? Well, matter of fact, you know this guy very well. He's the guy that goes around to all the motels and puts a Bible in there. You know, the Gideon Bible. <laughs> Remember Gideon? He tested God. He says, now God says, I want you to go out here and I want you to wipe out this army. Ooh, we don't know now, is this really God or not? I'll tell you what, uh, let the dew fall on the fleece and uh, let the ground be dry. Next morning, there was. Ooh, hmm. I wonder if that was a quirk. Lord, let the dew be on the ground and the fleece dry. We'll find out now. There was the next morning. Well, I guess it really is God telling me, okay, you know how many men he had? This is in Judges 7. 32,000. Wow, that's a pretty good sized army. 32,000. Guys, says, get in. We don't need all those men. They're going to get in the way. They're going to fall over each other and so on. Tell anybody that wants to go home, they can go home. We'll cut the numbers down a little bit. You know how many went home? 22,000 says, okay, Gideon, I like that. I'm heading out of here. I'm hooking them up. George Washington had the same problem in the uh, Revolutionary War. Fascinating reading. Same problem. Only his went because they just flat wanted out of there. Not because God told them. Well, he's still got too many. How many has he got? 10,000. You know, here's old Gideon. I only got 10,000 men now. I ah, still too many, Gideon. Have them go out and drink out of the stream. Let's see how they drink. 300 of them scooped the water up and drank out of their hand. The rest of them are down there, you know, their face in water, you know, waiting for someone <laughs> to <laughs> chop their head off. 300 men they had. That's all. Then of all things, God told him, divide your men into three groups. What? A hundred each. Then you know the story. They surrounded the, uh, oh, the Malachites, I believe it was. I didn't write down here who it was. And with the, their lamp in the, in the container, and they blew, all blew the trumpet. 300 trumpets. Ooh, that's got to be how many men coming. And here's the lights, you know, pop up. And there were total confusion, and they won the battle with 300 men. Now, what kind of faith did that take? Gideon still had some faith, didn't he? He just kind of wanted to, you know, <laughs> but God really wanted to show him at the end, you see, how, what, I can, what God can do. God didn't need 300 men. For pity's sakes, he didn't even need one. He could have confused them all so bad, which he did anyhow, that they would have killed one another. And that happened more than once, didn't it? But he showed Gideon, hey, look, Gideon, I can do it. Just have a little faith in me. Forget about the dumb old fleece out there. Do all over it. Forget about all these guys that don't want to fight. What good are they anyhow? 
How can we experience the joy of blessings if we always play it safe and stay in the boat? See, that's why a lot of people have never been blessed. They never got out of the boat. They never said, Lord, I will trust you. Explicitly. You know, you did that when you were baptized, didn't you? Yeah, you did. You says, I believe you died, Christ. We can prove that. Even the Muslim religion has Christ in the Koran. And they say he was a very good prophet. Of course, uh, Mohammed was better, but anyhow. But they even know he existed. Your pagan writers knew he existed. They knew he died. They knew he was resurrected. We don't need blind faith. Blind faith is worthless. God does not want blind faith. Example. Sell your homes this week and give all your money to me. Period. Have faith in me. Then I'll take care of it for you. Well, that'd be blind faith, wouldn't it? And you'd be very broke next week. <laughs> no, we don't have blind faith. We don't want blind faith. God doesn't want blind faith. He never did. He gave us so many examples in the Old Testament of fulfilled prophecy. We go over in the nation of Israel now, and the Bible says there was a town by the name of uh, Ai, up here a little ways from uh, Jericho. Do you know they didn't believe that till they started digging there? Oh, they ran across the ruins of a town. Isn't that amazing? And that happens time and time again. When the Bible says something is, it's there. It's there. This is all, you see, to instill confidence in us to increase our faith because we're, we're not, there's no such thing as a leap of faith. Yeah, I'll tell you where you end up with that leap, right in the lake of fire. We go where no man has gone before. You know, we're going to walk on a whole new planet when this earth is entirely refurbished during the millennium. A little bit, not quite the same, but a little bit like Noah. A little bit like Noah. God's going to cut the population down. He's had a habit of doing that. The plague. A third of Europe died. Think about that. A third. Wars. How many people have died in wars? And the numbers there gets, just get to be ridiculous, don't they? Get to be ridiculous. All right. Turn to Acts, the third chapter. Acts 3. Fortunately, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> Acts 3. Now, let's take a look at something that happened here. Could you and I fulfill what happened? Real simple. Acts 3. Now, Peter and John went up together in, uh, to the temple uh, at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. That'd be 3 in the afternoon. And a certain man, uh, lame from his, let's see, 3. Yeah, three in the afternoon. Now, I knew that. Why did I question it? <laughs> Anyhow, a certain man lame from his mother's womb. Now, this guy couldn't walk, never walked a step in his life, whom they laid uh, daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. He was a beggar. He had no way of working, so he begged for his, uh, his substance. So seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked alms. Well, we have them today, don't we? We call them panhandlers on the street corner with their signs. Viet how come they're always Vietnam vets? I don't know. I always wonder, what come? What did Vietnam do? Give us a lot of beggars for vets, but anyhow. And another one like Vietnam vet living back in the woods. <laughs> with my three children, anyhow. And, he th and now I'm, I'm not making fun, but you know, there are places where you can get a job today. Uh... And fixing his eyes upon him uh, with John and Peter said, look at us. You know, they looked at him and said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Ooh, I'm going to get a $100 bill or whatever. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. I don't have any money, fella. But what I do have, I give you. And what I'm going to give you is worth all more than all the gold and silver in the world. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, whose faith did that? Not the beggar. He had no idea what they were going to say. 
Peter and John. They had enough faith to make that statement because they knew Christ would do it. And what happened? And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately, you see, now it doesn't say he jumped up. Maybe he was still crippled until they picked him up. Kind of sounds that way. But immediately, as the, uh, and immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. So that he leaped up, he stood and walked, and he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, praising God. The man knew how to walk. It's more than just a healing. If you lay, lay in, the, in a hospital and you don't walk for you know, X amount of time, they have to teach you how to walk again. This guy could walk and jump and leap, and, and he was normal. Now, what did that take that took faith on Peter and John's part? It takes faith on our part. When I anoint someone, do I have faith that God is going to carry out that? Uh, yes, I will even thank him for that healing at the end of my prayer. I'll never forget. I've never mentioned this to anyone. Pat and I had a little girl that died. She was a month old. And this minister, and to this day, I really honor him. He came and he anointed her. Now, she was dead. And he knew that. But he still anointed her. Only he didn't anoint her to get well. He asked God to resurrect her. I'll never forget that. That took a lot of courage, didn't it? God didn't do it because he just, we had enough kids. We already had six. But I never forgot that. I never asked God to resurrect anyone. Maybe I don't have the courage. I don't know. But he did. Never will I forget that. His name was Leroy Neff. If you ever run across him, very nice old gentleman. Uh, did we finish here? Yeah, okay. All right, number one, it took courage to take that first step. Oh, it takes courage to step out of the boat. Remember, you're comfortable. You're comfortable. It's warm. You're all tucked into your bed. I love the, a nice warm bed. <laughs> to me, that's a real luxury. Soft and comfortable. That's where you're tucked in, so it takes courage to step out of there, to leave it, to leave it behind, possibly, and never get back to it. Number two, you don't have fear because you're looking to Christ. You're saying, Christ, I need your help to do this. I need his help to give a sermon. If you would have told me 30 years ago, I would have been ordained 30 years, December 28th. If you would have told me 30 years ago today, I would be standing here today giving you a sermon that's an hour long. <laughs> you would have heard belly laughter like you would not have believed because I would not have believed it. Very honestly. Because I had no idea I had that ability. I had no idea I had that capability. And number three, failure. Christ will put his hand out and pull you back up. Failure is not possible with Christ. He will keep you above the water. Number four, don't just ask on impulse. Oh, by the way, Lord, I bought a, a lottery ticket last night. Would you mind? <laughs> Uh, no, if you bought a lottery ticket, just tell them I threw a dollar away. That's what's going to happen to it. Help. Where, where's our help come from? Jesus Christ. If we keep our eye on him, if we keep our eye on him, we better have our eye on him because that's where we're headed, isn't it? Isn't that our ultimate goal? To be in a resurrection and to meet him and have him say, Atta boy, I am so proud of you. Well, doesn't that make you just kind of shiver to even think about it? It certainly wouldn't want him to say, I am so ashamed of you. And number six, love. Christ's love never stops or fails. Ours should never stop or fail for him. All right, those six items. Courage, get out of the boat. 
I suppose if things get bad enough and you don't burn the bridge behind you, you can climb back in the boat. <laughs> so I say, I burnt my bridges. There was no way I could go back. Fear, you look to Christ. There'll be no fear. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of failure. He will not let you fail. And don't act on impulse. Impulse, you see, is a, a, a thought of the moment, not thought out well. And it may be something he does not approve of. If it's not with his approval, he won't do it. He will not do it unless he approves it. You get your eye help from him by keeping your eye on him, and his love will never leave you or fail you. Are you going to go where no man has ever gone before? It's your move. <laughs>